Stephanie Lacour. All right, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here to share with you some of our latest work on neurotechnology. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm not going to talk about neuroscience, but I'm going to talk about mechanics. And I'll show you why it's important. So the nervous system is actually a complex mechanical machine. And here what I've shown, uh, or what I've placed on the, on the screen, is a scale that, that reports on the elastic modulus. This is uh, the ability of a material to deform and see how hard or soft the material is. So if you take a stainless steel ball, it will be most likely very, very rigid, very hard. So it will be in the order of hundreds of kilo, kilo, um, gigapascal. Sorry. Whereas if you take a gel, you'll be on the other extreme, and it will be more of the order of 100 or a kilopascal. So where do neural tissues stand? Nervous tissue are actually some of the softest part of our body, and in particular the brain has um, a typical elastic modulus around 100 to a few kilopascal. The spinal cord is equally soft, but what is also interesting is that the, both the brain and the spinal cord are protected by a skin called the dura mater, and the skin is slightly tougher than the, uh, the brain and the spinal cord, and in terms of elasticity, or it, it's in the order of a megapascal. So you'll see in a moment why this is important. So this is for the static parameters of the nervous system. But what is also interesting is that the nervous system is also mobile and constantly in action. So if you look at the brain, here's an MRI scan of a pulsating brain. You can see that uh, just because of the regular blood flow, uh, you have constant motion of the brain. Similarly, and more on a macroscopic scale, if you, during your daily movement, when you stretch, when you go and tie your laces in your shoes, you will, your spinal cord will elongate and compress over a quite large range of deformation. So that means that the nervous system is also a dynamic structure. So now let's have a look at what we use today to interface these very soft, complex uh, mechanical machine um, with the mind-made devices, and let's see how, how, how we do with that. So at the moment, so here you're familiar now with the scale. This is the uh, elasticity of the material. And let's see how implantable electrodes that we use to communicate with the nervous system um, uh, respond to mechanics. And here are the two um, sort of most mature technology that are developed uh, initially in, in, in research labs, but now also both of these techniques, um, technology here are, are being, uh, going through um, clinical trials. But if you see here, the first example is prepared with silicon. Silicon was uh, developed primarily for microelectronics and MEMS application. It's a material that is really hard, really rigid, uh, typically hundreds of gigapascal in terms of um, elastic modulus. But the advantage of this material is that we know how to machine, how to precisely and uh, uh, um, pattern structure that are very small. So here you have an array of electrode that looks like little, uh, little needle that are so small and so dense that they can really penetrate the nervous system, so the brain or the spinal cord eventually. So this is very, very interesting to have large number of information collected from the brain. Now, in the beginning of the century, we also moved, the, the field also moved slightly to use material that are a little bit more compliant, and in particular using plastic, and here is an example, polyimide or pyrrolein or, 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 or plastic that are very often used now to make uh, electrode implants. But if you look at this material, again, plastic are quite stiff. They are in the gigapascal range. So overall, the, 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 in, the electrode interfaces we're using today to make uh, electrode implants are very rigid, very stiff. This causes then all sorts of problems when we leave these devices over time in the body. The main challenge is what is called foreign body reaction, and this is illustrated here uh, with this picture where, where there's the black hole in the middle. There was, this is where the electrode was, was removed, and then we looked at different tissue, or this group looked at different tissue. And what you see is that surrounding the tissue, there's a layer of cells, and these cells are usually um, inflammation cells that are triggered because something doesn't look like the natural host biological tissue. And the challenge with this scarring tissue is that it tends to isolate your electrode with the surrounding tissue. And this is particularly critical with uh, electrode that you want to use to read signal from the nervous system. 
And then, so this is what the effect of the implant on the nervous uh, tissue, but there's also the reverse mechanism. So leaving an implant, an electrode implant, for a long time in the biological tissue can also damage the electrode itself. And here you have a picture, a scanning uh, electron micrograph of an electrode, one of the a similar version of these very uh, sharp needles electrode that have been residing in, in the brain for several months, and you see that a lot of damage has occurred to the, to the, to the electrode. So some of the coating are, are broken, it's, and the overall shape of the device is, um, is, is, is no longer uh, the, the, the one we designed. And so here we have stiff and static interfaces, which obviously are not the ideal design to make long-term interfaces with a soft dynamic neural tissue. So what we've been exploring over the last few years in my lab and in collaboration also with other groups here at EPFL is that we asked this following question is that would soft implant better integrate with the host biological tissue? And if yes, can we make or can we engineer the appropriate electrode technology so that we can make soft electrode implant? So now, in the next uh, few slides, I will take you through our journey where we, we explored primarily the first question, do soft implant make a difference? And in order to test our hypothesis, we selected probably the most challenging uh, environment, which is the spinal cord. So challenging in terms of mechanical environment. So here, the spinal cord is actually a very heterogeneous structure. Here is a cross-section cartoon of the overall spinal cord. So first of all, you have the vertebra. Uh, so it's a bone structure that is protecting the overall spinal cord. And inside the uh, spinal canal, we have the dura mater, the skin that protects the spinal cord and the spinal cord itself. In terms of their static mechanical properties, you can see that we have many, many orders of magnitude different between those different materials. If you want to design a, an implant that will communicate with the spinal cord, most likely it will sit either above the spinal cord or immediately below the spinal cord. So this is for the static properties. But now let's look at the shape and, and the movement or the dynamic of the spinal cord. Well, the spinal cord at first approximation is, can be modeled like a tube. So if you look at me standing here, my spinal cord is probably very straight. And so you could assume that by taking a simple film, you could cover that cylinder with a simple film. And that works quite well. But now, if you consider that you're moving, so by uh, doing flexion and, and extension, uh, when you're doing your daily movement, actually the cylinder becomes now a structure that has a very complicated curvature. And this, if you use simply a foil or a simple piece of, of material that do not deform, and cannot accommodate, com accommodate those complex curvature, you, you probably will have problem. So in order to analyze really uh, if this dynamic property of the, of the implant would, uh, would matter, we've done the following tests. So we picked two material that are very standard for uh, microfabrication and, the and also used in implants. So we compared plastic, which you see here on the top, pic on the top movie. This is a piece of, of polyimide. It's a material that, as you can see, is very flexible. We can twist it and so on. And we compared that to elastomers, which are behaving pretty much like rubber bands. So we usually work with silicone rubber. And then we set up to do the following experiment. So we, we, dis we compared three types of uh, uh, three groups of animals. We had animals that were with an intact spinal cord, so all of the animals we, we used here were healthy animals. We compared, so healthy animals. Then we implanted animals with uh, what we call a stiff implant, so the one made out of, of, the, of the plastic. And then we compared also third group with uh, animals who had an implant placed immediately at the surface of the spinal cord, but now the implant is soft. And we've monitored different functions. So the first thing is that over time, we've monitored the motor performance of the, of the animal who were carrying the implant. And so we had trained the animals to, to walk onto a ladder. So this is a, a, a movie of the actual experiment. And then with trackers uh, placed on the legs of the animal, we monitored how, the, how well or the, 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 the animal walks over time. So here you showed the first, the first group of animals. It was walking with no problem over the ladder. The animals carrying the stiff implant uh, started to miss some of the step and, ha and have some motor uh, challenges over time, whereas the one carrying the soft implant continue and walk just normally like the regular 
uh, like the animal carrying no implant. So here we had the first hint at, say, at showing that mechanic must be doing something because we have uh, groups of animals that uh, um, behave very differently. And of course we've quantified this and the take home message here is, to, is the following is that in terms of the motor performance of the animal, the, stiff, the animal carrying the stiff implant were not working as well as those work, uh, carrying the soft implant. So then we did, of course, uh, some, we explanted the, the, the spinal cord and we looked a little bit closer at what exactly was happening at the interface. So first we looked macroscopically at, uh, at the explanted spinal cord and here are 3D reconstruction of the explanted spinal cord and on the macroscopic cell you can see immediately the big difference. So nor, uh, imp, uh, intact spinal cord or uh, spinal cord carrying the soft implant nearly look the same, no damage to the, the tissue. Whereas the um, implant that the, the, the spinal cord that were carrying the stiff implant were massively um, compressed and, comp and, and their shape was also very much altered. We we'll looked then a little closer uh, at the cellular level and we, tr we tracked what is called neuroinflammation, where we track particular cells that are triggered when um, uh, foreign body reaction um, is, is, is uh, occurring. And again, we compared the, uh, the different type of animal, and here it's obvious from also this color map that there's a lot of neuroinflammation um, that is uh, triggered by the stiff implant. So this is all for the observation, but this didn't really tell us still why the soft was performing better. So we went back to the mechanics. So here we came up with actually two main rules that we need to ensure we have those good uh, implant tissue interfaces. So first, one parameter that is important is what is called the bending stiffness. And this relates to how well a structure can conform a circular or curvilinear structure. And here you have an image of a cross section of a tube that is very soft, where we have a very soft implant that is pushing at the surface. You see the circle is pretty much not uh, change, whereas if we have an implant made of a material that is much stiffer, then it will start to change its shape. So if you have too high of a bending stiffness, you will have macroscopic deformation or distortion of the soft tissue. In terms of the dynamics, uh, it's the elastic stiffness now that comes into play. And so what we've done following experiment where we had, again, a very soft um, uh, tissue or a, a, a gel that we stretch, so the soft material will expand and relax. So here we, we applied 10% deformation and we monitor what would happen in the implant. If we use an implant that is stiff, like the one we, I, I showed before in plastic, then it doesn't stretch. It's a material that is not designed to deform. And so the strain in, seen in this material remains zero. Whereas if you take a soft implant made of our silicone rubber, it will just accommodate and move along the tissue itself. And so that means that if you have a very stiff implant that is not elastic, it will restrict the local motion of your underlying tissue. And it will also slide, that's what we observed as well, which will then crea create a lot of shear stress at the interface between your implant and the tissue. So the take home message here is that implant softness matters and you need not only conformability, but you also need elasticity. So we answered our first question saying does soft matter and, in, in, and here I hope I've convinced you that it does. So the second question was can we make now electrodes to use this soft material so that we can make useful electrode interfaces? And the answer is yes. So we spent a lot of time optimizing a technology so now we could have an implant that can stretch reversibly but all of its component can stretch reversibly. So here, what you're looking at um, on the left-hand side, <coughs> excuse me, the clear material is a standard silicone rubber. Then we've, we found a way to make metallic tracks out of very thin layers of gold that can stretch and yet conduct electricity. So we have uh, these, are these, these tracks here that are stretchable leads. Then we also engineered some uh, coating at the site of the electrode, which corresponds to these little dots here. 
And these electrodes are made of a composite of platinum and silicone so that we can have efficient electrical stimulation or, uh, or uh, um, information transfer between the electrodes and the tissue and yet maintain electrical <laughs> compliance. And here in this li little video, you can see that we, we can cycle back and forth. Here we're stretching to 20% our electrode array, uh, and it's really robust and resists this type of deformation. And then as an added bonus to this technology, we've also integrated drug delivery in the system. So you also using the silicone rubber as the carrier material, we were able to add microfluidic channel. And here you can see that we have a little drop of liquid that is coming out of the implant even when we're stretching it. So we have really developed a technique where all of the components are highly compliant and yet fully functional. And so then, of course, we teamed up with our good uh, colleague here at EPFL, the group from Grégoire Courtin, who is a, an expert in spinal cord, and we used this technology to um, restore locomotion after spinal cord injury. So here, I'll just show you uh, one slide. Uh, Grégoire is also talking this afternoon, so I'm sure you'll learn much more about, about this um, in the afternoon, so stay tuned. But here, what, we, what we're seeing is um, uh, an image of the implant in light blue, that is really integrated into the spinal canal. This was taken two months two month post-implantation. This is also a, an image that is a cross-section of the structure where we have the spinal cord, and here just at the surface, we have our soft implant with the black ducts here corresponding to the electrode. So we really have a nice integration and no deformation of the spinal cord after two months of implantation. And in terms of what did we do with this, so here now we're in a scenario where we, 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 we have um, um, subjects that are with a spinal cord injury, and we've, we've placed the implant immediately below the, the, the site of injury. So we have a, a robotics in, in, in Gregor Courtin's lab. There's a robotic system that allows us to uh, monitor locomotion in uh, bipedal mode for, for the animal. So the animal sits in a little jacket. It's working on the treadmill. And then what is important is to see what will happen to the legs. So here on the left, you have the implant in blue sitting on the surface of the spinal cord. We don't apply any stimulation. Both legs, the red and, 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 green, and green, don't move. Now we inject chemi uh, chemical uh, stimulation, and this doesn't change the uh, locomotion either. But when we start applying combined uh, chemical and electrical stimulation, we can actually reactivate the, um, the spinal circuitry and then restore locomotion in the hind limbs. So this is the story I wanted to tell today. So this is where we, we started. Um, and here I want, so I hope the, the, you're now all convinced that the mechanical signature of an implant matters. So. We've had, over the last uh, 30 years or so, quite significant advances in the technology for neural implant, and now we have a new one called uh, a round soft technology where we hope uh, we'll be able to translate and, and use in, um, in, in various contexts for neuroprosthesis. A very important aspect, and I'll wrap up on this, this is, I know, very academic, but I think nothing will happen without us, our student and group members. And what is extremely important also in the field of neuroprosthetic is that you need to integrate and mix people with very different backgrounds. And this is what we, we've managed to achieve across our two labs and also on the wider scale with the Center for Neuroprosthetic at EPFL. Thank you very much for your attention.